A very good afternoon to everyone present here. I am Riti Jindal, the student coordinator at Law Internships and the moderator for today's interactive session organized by Law Internships. Law Internships provides internship opportunities in the field of law, primarily to the students pursuing undergraduate or postgraduate programs. Advocate Amrita Jain, partner at Law Internships, along with her team of young, dynamic and competent members, assist in providing opportunities for gaining professional experience as well as improving legal skills while being enrolled in a full-time law program. The objective is to prepare students for the real world by imparting practical exposure and relevant skills through legal internships. We have amongst us Mr. S. Vivekananda sir, partner at VGB Associates. <laughs> sir graduated from the University Law College, Bangalore in the year 2000. Along with a degree of law, Sir also qualified as a company secretary. He has done his master's in law from Anamalai University. Since 2004, Sir has been practicing in VGB Associates and he is presently the partner at VGB Associates. Sir's focus area of practice are on corporate matters, corporate litigation, insolvency and bankruptcy and commercial arbitration. He irregularly appears before NCLT and NCLAT, apart from appearing in various courts. We welcome you, sir. If anyone has any uh, queries or questions, you can either uh, raise your hand uh, or you can write the, uh, your questions in the chat box as we'll have the, uh, in the end, we'll have the flow for the questions open. Uh, without uh, delaying any further, let's begin the session for today. Over to you, sir. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, I uh, really appreciate the law internships organization, Amrita Jain and Riti Jindal for, you know, and the others who have taken this initiative of, uh, you know, coordinating this judgment writing competition and the uh, precursor to this. And I must say, uh, judgment writing is something that I did not learn when I was in college, probably even for the first couple of years when I got into practice, I did not look at or probably even think about uh, looking into the nuances of judgment writing. But with the passage of time, I realized it's very important to understand and under, you, know, uh, you know, decipher the skill, the requirements of a judgment writing. Now it's like this. Now when we are practicing as advocates, we get so involved with our clients that we believe completely what they say. And they may be true in what they say. But the point is documents may not support their stand. So what happens is when we actually look at the other uh, party's perspective, we actually get a balanced view of the case. We understand how strong our cases or how weak our cases. And that is where judgment writing helps you look at things in a balanced perspective. You actually see the whole thing. Or the, you get a complete picture and a complete perspective to the entire case, both from the plaintiff's side and the defendant's side or the petitioner's side and the respondent's side. So this becomes very important. And uh, as such, I really appreciate the organizers for coming up with this uh, idea and event. Uh, friends, you're all aware that judgment writing is, uh, or judgment is a statement or a decision given by a judge based on reasons. And generally, it is the judgment which is the conclusive stage of any case. We uh, look forward eagerly to the judgment to know how far our efforts have been paid off and whether we have succeeded and if succeeded, to what extent have we succeeded or probably if this is a judgment which is partially decreed and uh, you know what is the reason why it has not been fully decreed. So these are things that we look at when a judgment is rendered. And uh, I must say the reasoning part is the heart and soul of a judgment. Now the, without a reason, you don't understand why your case has been allowed or rejected. And if at all it is allowed or if it is rejected, we don't know what documents have been considered, what weighed on the judge to pass or take such a decision in the matter. As you all know, the moment we think of art, you know, the topic that has been given to me is the art of judgment writing. The moment we think of art, we think of music, we think of dance, we think of literature. Now, through these art forms, something is communicated. Now, similarly in judgments, we must know for a fact that judges 
do not speak in the public they don't come out in the public and openly express their views on a particular point of law or point of fact they express their views through judgments so they communicate themselves through judgments and in fact uh, judges are to be considered as hermits where they give up all their ambitions of getting on to the public you know public field they confine themselves to their work express themselves through judgments ensure that justice is done through their judgments so for all purposes judges are looked at as hermits and saints now if you actually look at a judgment the wit or the, the real crux of a judgment lies in its brevity simplicity and clarity it should be brief now if probably uh, a judgment runs beyond the number of pages otherwise than what it could have been communicated in i'm sure it doesn't serve the purpose or probably it makes the whole thing boring repetition makes it boring and when we look at a judgment a clarity the clarity is seen through it now the moment you see a judgment you understand where things are uh, really weighed on the judge where things have not considered and why he has not considered certain aspects so clarity is important and simplicity is i must say the soul as i said you know reasoning is a soul simplicity plays a very important role if it is not simple or probably if the language used is winding it is you know uh, i must say you have a lot of jargons which makes it difficult for a layman to understand and you know in fact there are situations where by the time you come to the end of the sentence you you really forget what was the beginning of the sentence you really lose track of what was the the intention of the judge in communicating to us now probably we look at we generally make a comparison of uh, mr denning lord denning and uh, justice uh, krishnayer krishnayer was verbose he would you know communicate in the most flamboyant language he was very you know colorful he he ensured that it was laid down in a very colorful mm -hmm. manner mm -hmm. while mr denning was in its all around and uh, you know he he was to the point brevity was the soul of his judgments but that doesn't mean that justice very krishnayer did not contribute there was huge contribution on the part of justice krishnayer to the legal uh, uh, field but what happens is it becomes easy for people to understand when the judgments are brief simple and there is clarity in the judgment now with these i must say judgments actually communicate the intention of the judge now that is where articulation becomes important and a judge for coming out with a good judgment should know should understand the facts completely should understand the law completely and ensure that the correct law is applied to the facts in many situations we see where a law is not probably even without an understanding a proper understanding of the facts some law which is not actually to be applied is applied which actually renders in injustice being done so we must ensure that as judges we know what the facts are and how the law becomes applicable and we should not rush to apply precedents unless these precedents are applicable to the facts of the case because each case revolves around the facts of the case now there could be situations where the facts could actually determine how a case differs from the outcome of another case so there could be a distinctive feature in or based on the facts of the case so it becomes very important for anyone writing a judgment to have a thorough understanding of the procedural laws and substantive law now when i say procedural law i mean the civil procedure code the evidence act the limitation act the stamp act now these are the procedural laws which actually guide us on the procedural aspects and we have when we when i say substantive law it is a law on which the entire case revolves around now let us say it is a case for partition it depends upon the it, the law the substantive law would be the hindu succession act or probably if it's a case relating to uh, rendition of accounts in a partnership firm it could be the partnership act or let us say it relates to a breach of contract the contract act is a substantive law so it, it becomes very important for us to understand the law the substantive law very clearly to ensure that the substantive law the correct provisions of the substantive law is applied now there could also be situations where you have interplay of laws where there are two laws probably which look uh, apparently 
uh, you know contradictory uh, how do you resolve this so we must have an understanding of which law prevails over the other is there a non obstante clause that is is there a clause which overrides the other legislations so we'll have to understand now if you generally look at it you have uh, the uh, let us say companies act you have the securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of security interest act where the banks ensure that they recover the money that is due to them by actually attaching the security that is furnished to them now if there is a conflict between any other law and surfasi which would prevail is a surfasi which would prevail because it is a special legislation now if there is a conflict between the surfasi act that is a securitization act and let us say the insolvency and bankruptcy code the insolvency and bankruptcy code would prevail because there are a lot of non obstante clauses which overrides various other provisions of various other legislations so the understanding of the interplay of laws become very important or there could be a situation where you have two three laws which have to be read together to en to ensure that we get an outcome for a particular case probably you may have specific relief act you may have, you may have transfer of property act you may have contract act you have to have a, a synchronous understanding and application of all the three laws to ensure that you come up with the right application of the mixture of the three laws and you come up with the right decision so it is very important that we understand the various laws this becomes important now if you were to ask me a question should a judge know all the laws now there are amendments which come in every other day should a judge know all the law all the laws that are should a judge know all the laws now practically at times it becomes impossible but what is expected of a judge is that he must be in a position to absorb and grasp things when the arguments are put across now there are advocates to assist you have one for the plaintiff and you have one for the defendant and uh, both the advocates assist the court in coming to a just decision now the judge is required to ensure that he puts questions relevant questions probing questions which help him understand the legal position that becomes prevalent or that becomes applicable to the case on hand he must also be in a position to appreciate how the law or the amendments become applicable to the facts of the case so he must have an understanding of the facts and the applicable law the amendments whether it has a retrospective effect or a prospective effect now you probably would have come across a recent decision of the supreme court on section 6 of the hindu succession act where the daughters have been given equal rights in the share of the uh, hindu undivided uh, property family property now how would it be interpreted would it have a prospective effect or a retrospective effect so all these things have to be understood before a case on this particular issue is adjudicated now let's look at the different types of judgment or the different types of courts that we would be required to uh, consider for the purpose of judgment writing now you have basically a trial court a trial court could be a munsif court or it could be a, a junior division civil court or let us say if the place of jurisdiction is a district court it could be the district court so this is a trial court and the trial court is a place where the evidence is led now i must tell you a trial court is a court where you file a civil suit or an original suit and what the plaintiff files the parties to the suit are called plaintiff and defendant the plaintiff files a plaint and the defendant files a written statement written statement is a statement of defense that a defendant submits to the court now for all purposes any court other than the original jurisdiction or the original suit or a civil suit any other jurisdiction would be a uh, the, the rank of the parties would be a petty would be called the petitioner and the respondent so if you file a case if you file you know you are you make your presentation or submissions before the high court it would be called a petition now let us say you file writ jurisdiction you file a submission before the uh, high court in a writ jurisdiction it would be called a writ petition now you file a petition before the family court it would be a mc or a matrimonial case or a petition so every other forum where it would be present now let us say you go to the consumer forum it would be a complaint but uh, and you know what happens is you file the petition and you have the objection statement or statement of objections or a counter affidavit by way of statement of objection so this is the basic difference so in a trial court the 
pleadings when i mean pleadings the plain the written statement are called pleadings the pleadings are considered along with the evidence by evidence i mean documentary evidence and oral evidence now the trial court is required to collect evidence in sense the parties are called upon to lead their evidence and when parties are called upon to lead their evidence the plaintiff has to submit his affidavit evidence and his documentary evidence to substantiate or corroborate his statement by way of evidence so uh, and probably he also brings in other persons as witnesses now generally what we uh, you know it differs from place to place but a plaintiff witness is called pw and depending upon the number of witnesses we mark them as pw1 plaintiff witness 1 plaintiff witness 2 so these are the this is the sequence in which they are numbered and then you have the defendant and what happens is once the evidence is laid by the plaintiff the defendant is or his counsel is permitted to cross examine the plaintiff witnesses and after the cross examination of the plaintiff witnesses of course the cross examination happens based on the pleadings and the evidence both oral and documentary evidence and the subsequent to the plaintiff's evidence the defendant is called upon to lead his evidence and the defendant is permitted to be cross examined by the plaintiff after this procedure is done you have the arguments of the main case and what comes out of the main case is called the judgment for a moment i should also uh, explain what how an order differs from a judgment an order is a decision rendered by the court on any interlocutory application now let us say there is a, a suit filed for injunction for a permanent injunction and uh, let me give you an example now let us say i have a property and my neighbor tries to encroach you now he is putting up construction now he breaks my compound wall on one side where his property is situated and he tries to put his pillars into my property and then he puts a well he digs a well or he digs a bore well in his place which results in the collapsing of a particular portion of my house now what happens is i immediately rush to the court and file a suit for injunction a suit for permanent injunction restraining the defendant from further encroaching into my property and i in the suit i also ask for damages or compensation for the loss suffered by me now this is a small example we will retain this example for the purpose of addressing various uh, aspects and for us to understand the various principles now let us say the plaintiff goes to the court now he wants an immediate order he wants some order whereby he uh, i probably i want an i mean an order immediately to stop the defendant from proceeding with the construction so i file a plaint has to be filed plaint is a pleading where i bring out the entire facts of the case and along with the pleadings and documents i also file an application which is called the interlocutory application or the interim application i request the court to immediately pass an order of injunction an order of temporary injunction an order of ex parte temporary injunction restraining the defendant from carrying on any construction and let us say the court is convinced that i have a case the property belongs to me and that the defendant has dug a bore well and he is encroached into my property then the court passes an interim order of injunction restraining the defendant from further carrying on his work now this is an order an order is passed on an interim application we call it an interim application or an interlocutory application so an order is passed on an interim interlocutory application whereas a judgment is passed on the main case <coughs> where the plaintiff that subsequent to the plaintiff filing the suit the defendant files his written statement and subsequent to filing of the written statement no let us understand when a written statement is filed now in this instant case where i say that the neighbor has encroached into my property he has broken down the compound wall and he has started putting up a column or a pillar into my in my premises and he's uh, he's dug a bore well on the edge of the uh, compound wall now i am you know now this is the position this is what i say the defendant states the plaintiff is not the owner of the property he has no local standing to maintain this case and i have not encroached into his premises he is the one who has encroached into my premises and as such i am very well within my limits when i put the uh, 
pillars or when i dig the uh, borewell now this is defense now there are certain admitted facts here what are the admitted facts admitted facts are that plaintiff and defendant are neighbors that's an admitted fact now what are the disputes now the other admitted fact is the defendant has put a borewell the defendant has put up a pillar these are admitted facts now what are the disputed facts plaintiff says that he is the owner of the premises or he says that he is in occupation of the premises the defendant says the plaintiff has no local standing to file this case he has nothing to do with this case he is a trespasser into the property that's a disputed question of fact now the other defense that the plaintiff defendant takes is that it is his property that he is putting up the column in he says that the borewell is being dug in his premises so and he says the portion that collapsed is a portion which is constructed in violation of the bylaws in, in in the premises of the defendant now this is a disputed question of fact let us understand issues are drafted by the court based on disputed questions of fact so the now so now what happens is plaintiff is filed written statement is filed now the court drafts issues where the court says court the questions that are drafted for issues are does the plaintiff prove that he has the local standing to maintain the case whether the defendant proves that he has put up the construction in the known premises whether the defendant proves that he has not encroached into the premises of the plaintiff now these are the issues drafted by the court for being decided in the judgment so the judgment would basically decide the issues for the purpose of deciding the issues the evidence the oral evidence and the documentary evidences are looked into and then along with the plain pleadings and then the judge passes the judgment he gives reasoning as to how he arrives at a particular conclusion and how the same is supported by facts of the case how the decisions or the reasoning is corroborated by various evidences given by one of the parties and why he arrives at a particular decision and how his decision is also supported by law now now in this instance that i gave you it is very much important to understand what issues are disputed what are not disputed now let us say there could be some other issues which require consideration so issues can be modified it can be recasted even at the time of judgment but the the, the parties would not be allowed to change their stands in the plaint and the written state they would only the judge can recast the issues based on the contents of the pleadings and the uh, uh, evidence so now the judges to understand the laws applicable now we know the facts we have understood the facts now how do we understand what laws are applicable now it's a suit for permanent injunction a suit for permanent injunction restraining the defendant from putting up further construction this is the main prayer and also there is another prayer telling seeking that the defendant be directed to pay compensation for the loss sustained by the plaintiff on account of collapse of a portion of the building now which are the laws that become applicable here if you look at permanent injunction the law that becomes applicable is the specific relief act so the judge is required to look at the various provisions of this of the specific relief act that becomes applicable and if you look at compensation that is asked for which law becomes applicable is it a breach of contract no because he is a neighbor there is no contract between us so what is the law that becomes applicable it because it, it, i'm sure most of you have would have read this the tort the law of torts become applicable now this is a civil wrong that has been done to me by digging a borewell in his premises and on account of that a portion of my building collapses now this is a civil wrong so i am entitled for compensation what is the remedy in case of a civil wrong damages so i am asking for damages which we call compensation i am telling uh, i am requesting the court to grant me damages so here is a suit for permanent injunction and damages now the judge has to understand the facts apply the law that becomes applicable and probably if he comes across or if he is assisted by the counsels with the relevant appropriate case laws he is supposed to apply that now i was giving you in fact i took a detour to help you understand the whole process now here we were talking about a trial court a trial court could be a court of small causes court a small causes court or a municipal court 
or a uh, no, civil judge junior division or civil judge senior division or a district court depending upon the place where the court is situated whether it's a you know whether it's a municipality or whether it comes in a district or a town it depends on where the court is situated and the jurisdiction the territorial jurisdiction that is given to it now let us say for a moment there is a civil court junior division which hears this matter and it passes a judgment now this civil court junior division would be called the court of original jurisdiction and the suit that is filed is called the original suit and the suit or probably in different places they also call it a civil suit now from here the first appeal would lie to the district court so we generally call it here as regular appeal now from the district court you can go on a second appeal to the high court so you have the regular second appeal now from the judgment that is probably passed by the high court you can approach the high the supreme court by virtue of an slp especially petition under article 136 of the constitution of india and if the supreme court is satisfied that there exists a substantial question of law to be decided it would admit the petition and the specially petition would be converted into a civil appeal and you have the civil appeal before the supreme court so let us understand a judgment passed by the civil court junior division a judgment passed by the uh, district court in first appeal a judgment passed by the uh, high court and the decision given by the supreme court are all called judgments these are all called judgments however now let us say uh, an order is passed or a decision is rendered in a writ petition it would be called an order so we should understand where you have judgments and how even the appellate court which modifies the judgment or which confirms the judgment would still be a judgment now probably even if you look at the revisional jurisdiction of high court even that would be called a judgment the decision of the high court in the revisional jurisdiction would also be called a judgment but however if an appeal is taken or a writ petition is filed on an interlocutory interlocutory order the order that is passed or the decision that is passed by the high court or the supreme court would not be a judgment so even if you have an order passed by the trial court and you take that up to the high court the decision that is rendered would be would still be called a would still be called an order so this is for us to understand how the uh, sequence goes now what happens in a trial court in a trial court there is an appreciation of fact and law by the uh, and the judgment and the judge renders his decision by appreciating the facts and applying the law so you have both law fact and law that is considered but the judge considers the fact and the law and he he is entitled to he looks at the entire facts of the case he looks at the pleadings he looks at the evidence oral and documentary and then he considers the judgment of the trial court and either confirms it or reverses it or there could be probably situations where the matter could be remanded back to the trial court stating that this particular aspect has not been covered by way of evidence so we must give an opportunity to the parties to lead further evidence could be oral evidence or documentary evidence for the purpose of appreciating the case in the true perspective so there could also be situations where the judgment is given by the appellate court remanding the matter back to the civil court or the trial court for the purpose of considering a few aspects relating to evidence so you have the first appellate court and then the second appellate court now let us say you have an appeal before the high court the second appellate we generally call it the regular second appeal in a regular second appeal the high court would only consider the substantial questions of law it would not consider facts and in fact when an appeal is filed a regular second appeal is filed we are required to mention the substantial questions of law for being considered by the high court and when it when it is further taken up to the supreme court it's clearly a question of law a substantial question of law is the only aspect that would be looked into in the specially petition or probably when the specially petition is admitted and the matter is converted into a civil appeal it would only be an appreciation of law now so we'll have to understand where we are situated are we now writing a judgment in the trial court or are we writing a judgment in the appellate court or are we writing in the first appellate court or are we writing a uh, judgment in the second appellate court or are we uh, in the supreme court so we are required to understand this for the purpose of understanding how we write a judgment 
So here, I must say there are now, let us say if a judgment is passed by the district court, the original jurisdiction, the trial court is a district court. In such a situation, there would only be one appeal to the high court. You will not have a second appeal. So what happens is a district court passes a judgment. You can approach the high court on first on appeal. And from there, so that's the end of it. But however, you can approach the Supreme Court by way of SLP and if convinced, you can take it up on civil appeal to the Supreme Court. So here, this being the position, we should appreciate where we stand. We should appreciate whether we are judges in the trial court or whether we are judges in the high court or whether we are judges in the Supreme Court. So now let us look at a trial court judgment. Let us think for a moment that we are judges of the trial court. It could be district court, civil court, junior division, civil court, senior division, whichever. Let us say for a moment we are judges of the trial court. So what happens here is that I look into the pleadings, the plain written statement, the evidence. Now let us say you have the documentary evidence in the case that I discussed with you on suit for permanent injunction. The plaintiff produces documents to say that this property is a property which belongs to my HUF and Hindu undivided family. And I'm not the owner, but I'm a co-partner. As such, I have a right to maintain the suit. And so the question of locus standi is the first issue. I find, well, I look into the position of law, whether a co-partner has a right to file a case. So that is the point which I'll have to examine. Or let us say he's the owner, he's the absolute owner, the plaintiff is the absolute owner. He produces documents to say that he's got a sale deal. So I don't have to look further. His local stand is established. Now, let us say I go further. In the case of a co-partner also, a co-partner can, or a, a member of a Hindu undivided family can take action to protect the HUF property. Now, let us say we look at the second issue. The second issue is whether the defendant, whether the plaintiff proves that the defendant has encroached into his property. When you look at this issue, you must appreciate the documentary evidence to know. Now, let us say you have the HUF uh, property, uh, HUF sale deed, title deed, which shows how this property came to be joint family. And probably, let us say it is a sale deed. Sale deed is in the name of one of the co partners So, you know, HUF, even if one of the co partners is the one person who gets a sale deed, it is a property which belongs to the entire HUF. Now, the point is, you look at the measurements, do the measurements tally with the suit? Generally what happens is when you file a suit, you also file a schedule to the property. The schedule of the property of the plaintiff and schedule of the property of the defendant is also brought out. So you look at the measurements to see if it tallies. The suit schedule measurements, whether they tally with the measurements given in the title deed. Now you do this and let us say for a moment, the property of the plaintiff is as shown in the sale deed. But however, the property or the title deed of the defendant is lesser than what is shown in the sale deed. The actual measurement is lesser than what is shown in the sale deed. In such a situation, it becomes a little complicated to actually know whether the plaintiff had previously encroached, whether the compound wall was previously put, and whether the defendant proves that it is his property. So then you'll have to look into a lot of other aspects. You'll have to look into the oral evidence, the uh, the documentary evidence to see what was the actual measurement. Probably there could be a situation where the court may be required to appoint a commissioner. A commissioner is appointed for the purpose of actually taking measurement of the properties of the plaintiff and defendant to know whether it tallies with the measurements given in the title deeds. Now that would help the court in analyzing and understanding whether there has been an encroachment by the defendant. So he has to look at all other evidences. Now this is a situation where a commissioner is appointed by the court. The commissioner could be an engineer or any person who is well versed with uh, you know, measurements or probably he could be a surveyor who would take measurements and report back to the court. So based on this, the court is required to appreciate whether there is an encroachment by the defendant or whether there is no encroachment or whether it is his property or not. So this is where the whole you know, the understanding of the case, the facts, the law become relevant. Now, irrespective of what the outcome is with regard to the suit for permanent injunction, the suit, in the same suit, there is also a prayer for compensation. There is a prayer telling, calling upon the defendant 
to pay compensation for the collapsing of a particular portion of the plaintiff's premises. Now, this has to be considered independently. Just now, let us say the court comes to a conclusion the plaintiff is not the owner of the portion which has been encroached by the defendant. Can he also dismiss or reject the prayer sought for by way of compensation? The answer is no. Because even if, let us say, it is his property, he digs a bore well, he must take sufficient precaution to ensure that the neighbors are not affected. So, let us say the uh, damage that is caused to the plaintiff should be considered and tortious liability has to be uh, brought into, uh, should be considered and the court has to appreciate that the plaintiff is entitled for the compensation. So these are the ways and means in which the court is required to appreciate the law, the facts applicable and the, the, the various precedents. Now, as I also told, it is very much important to understand which order would amount to a judgment which order would not amount to a judgment. Now, as I told, if there is a conclusive decision in a particular matter, generally it amounts to a judgment. Now, let us look at a situation where in this case, the defendant takes a stand that this is not his property at all. His property lies elsewhere. The plaintiff's property lies elsewhere. And as such, no cause of action is made out. I hope you understand what a cause of action is. The cause of action is the uh, actions which result in, uh, in right accruing to the plaintiff for the purpose of initiating a proceeding in a court of law. So the defendant takes a stand that there is no cause of action. And he files an application. The defendant files an application under order 7 rule 11. In fact, uh, I wouldn't get into the nitty gritties of the provisions uh, given uh, the understanding that probably you're all students. Now, but let me explain what this application is about. This application is filed for the purpose of dismissing the suit at the threshold on the ground that there is no cause of action. The property does not belong to the plaintiff. The plaintiff's property is elsewhere situated and here I'm producing the documents uh, or probably uh, <coughs> the let us say uh, of course order 7 rule 11 application is filed by the defendant stating that a reading of the pleadings by the plaintiff itself very clearly shows that he is not the owner of the premises in fact he says that he there was some dispute with regard to the identification of the property he also says that there was a case previously filed and there was a decision which rendered, which was rendered holding that he is not the owner of the property. So such being the case, I take advantage of the pleadings in the plaint and request that the plaint be dismissed. Now an application is filed to that effect. Let us say the court is convinced that there is no case, no cause of action and the case is, suit is dismissed. Now this is a, an order of rejection. Now this is not a main judgment because a main judgment would involve appreciation of pleadings evidence and then a judgment is rendered. But now here the judgment is or an order is passed giving a conclusive finding that the suit is not maintainable and the suit is rejected. Now would this order be a judgment? The answer is yes. Such an order would be a judgment. An order of rejection under order 7 rule 11 which decides the aspect relating to a cause of action would amount to a judgment. So from an order in a situation of this sort, an appeal would be maintainable. So let's appreciate in certain situations, from an order, you can also maintain a judgment. I hope I've made it clear. Now for a moment, let us say this application of the defendant had been rejected by the civil court, telling no, there is a cause of action. The application of the defendant is not maintainable. And let us say the application is dismissed. Now from this, would an appeal be maintainable? The answer is no. In fact, if you probably analyze section 115 of the civil procedure code, a revision would be maintainable. Because if the order would have been, would have been passed the other way, the entire case would have got disposed. And such being the case, a revision is maintainable. For a moment, let us say whatever it is, but an appeal is not maintainable. So if the matter is conclusively decided, an appeal is maintainable. If it is not, a writ petition or a revision would be maintainable. Now, 
So the uh, now, if you actually look at the whole case, the explanation that I've given and the understanding, you have to appreciate that the experience of the judge matters a lot. And now let us say we are not experienced because we are only students here. How do we ensure that we get experience? Let's understand the various provisions of law. Let's understand how to read of the facts, how to apply the law to the facts of the case, and how we come up with uh, a decision which is also justiciable in the sense which is which renders justice. Now, in fact, if you look at Justice uh, Wendell Holmes, he makes a statement: the life of the law has been has not been logic, but it has been experience. So here is a situation where you you know it's not possible for us to say law is after all logic, but there are many situations where it surpasses logic. It goes to ensure that justice is done. It may go beyond the law at times. Now, probably you look at Article 142 of the Constitution of India. Now, this is where we say, let us say, a special leave petition is filed. The judgment, the, the Supreme Court admits a matter. It's converted to a civil appeal. Under Article 142, the Supreme Court can do complete justice to ensure that there is rendition of justice and where there is the whole issue is resolved. Now, uh, so that is where we say, you know, life of law is not logic but experience. So it's very important that we understand the provisions of law, the facts, the applicability of the same. Now, given a situation, it's for us to understand that the judgment, now probably if you read some of the judgments, you can appreciate that some judgments are very lucid, free-flowing. The moment I read a judgment, I'm in a position to grasp it. So you have small sentences, you have uh, small ideas conveyed, there is brevity, there is clarity, there is absolute, you know, clear articulation, there is clarity that is seen in the judgment. While there are some judgments which are really good, the law is laid down, but it's not brief, it's quite winding, you know, and you know, uh, it becomes too difficult for us to grasp. So what happens is, that is where, when we write a judgment, you don't have to look at flamboyant language, look at simple language, ensure that the same is communicated in a manner that is uh, communicating or conveying what you actually intend to communicate. It's very important that you don't communicate something what you did not intend because it's, it's very common in law. You actually see when you read judgments, you have two negatives. You have three negatives. You have multiple negatives. That makes it all the more difficult to comprehend the judgment. So it is very much important that we avoid negatives, double negatives. We make the sentence as simple as possible. But of course, there would be situations where you need to bring in negatives to emphasize the provision to emphasize the decision based on a certain aspect of reasoning. So it is very much imp important that we have a lucid free flow of thoughts in our judgment. And uh, let us appreciate that each judge has his own style of writing. Now probably if you were to write a judgment, if I were to write a judgment in the same case, our style of delivery would differ. Our articulation would differ. That is fine, perfect. But what is important is have we understood the facts? Have we understood the law that becomes applicable? Have we understood the manner in which it has to be brought out? Have we understood what laws become, what case laws become applicable? So these are important. And it is very much important for us to make it as, as simple as possible. So simple that a third party who is not connected with the case should be in a position to read it. And he should be in a position to appreciate what the facts are and what the law is. Let me tell you what is very important when it comes to writing of judgments. It's an art. It's an art. It's as much a science. What is important is for us to develop the ability to precise write. Now, let us say I'm, I give you a five page uh, write up. You should be in a position to bring it out in a, in a, in a page. So, precise writing becomes very important for you to really bring out judgment in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, brief manner. By brevity, I don't mean you sacrifice whatever is material and relevant. Uh, what you do is you bring in whatever is relevant and still be brief. Now, when you actually look at a judgment, probably I'm sure you also had a session yesterday and that would have dealt with what is the content of a judgment. You have the judge bringing out in brief what the case is about. It's a suit for permanent injunction and a suit for damages. And this, these are the facts. Now, he should be in a position to 
say what the plaintiff has said in 20 pages, probably he must be in a position to say it in one page or two pages. And then you have the written statement. He must capture the defense made in a span of two or three pages. And then he goes on to deal with the issues. Then the applicable facts of the case, the law, and then he gives the, the decisions or the reasoning for coming to a particular conclusion. So that becomes important. And one more important thing is when we actually look at case laws, when we look at, we have the principle of stare decisis, where we have uh, the, the uh, uh, precedent, the rule of precedent. We have Article 141, which says the Supreme Court decisions and the High Court decisions become binding on all other courts. When you look at a judgment, there is something called ratio decidendi, and there's something called obitur dicta. Now, ratio decidendi is that aspect or that portion of the case law which lays down the law. It says that this is the this is what is the law of the land, and this is how it should be interpreted. Or let us say you have some amendment which comes up for interpretation. The court lays down that this has a prospective effect. So that is a law that is laid down and that is ratio desired in Now, I also said obitur dicta. Obitur dicta relates to those aspects that are passed or probably comments or observations made by judges in the course of deciding the case. Now, obitur dicta do not, does not become ratio desired in So if you were to decide a case, you are required to ignore the obitur dicta. You must know how to call out or probably understand which portion forms a ratio desidendi, which portion forms an obitur dicta, and only ensure that the ratio desidendi is applied. Now, if you were to look at, we were dealing with Article 142. Uh, Article 142 deals with a situation where the Supreme Court has the power to do complete justice. Now, can I take a particular case where a decision is rendered by the Supreme Court under Article 142 and say that becomes the law of the land. That is specifically given under those relevant circumstances, facts and circumstances, that wouldn't become a precedent. That wouldn't become a ratio. So we must be in a position to appreciate what forms a ratio, what forms an obitur dicta and ignore the obitur dicta. So what is relevant has to be culled out. So it's very important that we learn the art of precy writing. So the art of judgment writing to a great extent depends on the art of PC writing. And uh, as I said, now let us say if you go to the High Court or the Supreme Court, there is no question of reappreciation of evidence, no question of reappreciation of the pleadings, no question of reappreciation of facts. So for all purposes, the first appellate court becomes the final court of appeal insofar as facts are concerned. You must keep this in mind. Now let us say you are asked to write a judgment. You are given the facts. You are given the law and let us say you are asked to write a judgment and you are sitting in the Supreme Court. You are not supposed to look at the facts. You are required, required to look at the substantial question of law that becomes that, that, that is required to be considered by you. And at the end of the day when you write a judgment, you must be satisfied that you can understand it. You must also be satisfied that the parties can read it and you must also be satisfied that any third party who reads it would be in a position to comprehend your judgment. And uh, now just to give you a small example, uh, now there is a situation where I have documents to show that I am in possession of the premises and I file a suit for, uh, you know, injunction. I am in possession of a premises. Now the same case that I gave by way of an example, let us say I say that I am in possession of the premises. I give pleadings to support my case. I also produce documentary evidence to substantiate that I am in actual possession. I have a sale deed which says that I am in possession. I have old electricity receipts, electricity bills, water bills to show that I am paying the electricity and water bills. Now let us say I have produced electricity and water bills which are six months old. Now let us say the documents are very clear. Now in the cross-examination of the plaintiff, the plaintiff admits that he was thrown out of the possession of the premises. And for the last three months, he's not in possession of the premises. That is three months prior to initiating or filing the case, he was not in possession of the premises. Then the question arises whether he is entitled for an injunction. Probably the court may direct the, the court may have to direct the plaintiff to file a suit for possession. So these are aspects. Now your documentary evidence will be good. 
your pleadings may be perfect, but the cross examination shows that he's not in possession of the premises. So these are things that have to be looked at by the judge. These are things that have to be looked into by the judge. The pleadings, the oral evidence, the documentary evidence, all these have to be weighed and a judgment has to be given. Um, and of course, when you look at a judgment, you also get to know whether there has been a fair, fair trial. The moment you read a judgment, a third party would actually know whether there has been a fair trial. So when there is a fair trial, there is a fair judgment. Or there cannot be a fair judgment without a fair trial. Now, uh, now the same as the situation in case of criminal matters. Now let's understand, uh, there is something called burden of proof. Now when you are, let us say you are uh, a magistrate. Now the hierarchy of the criminal courts is like this. At the lowest rung, you have the magistrate. Though he's at the lowest rung, he's the most powerful. You have the magistrates and above him, you have the sessions judge and above him, you have the high court and then the Supreme Court. So let us say in a particular case, uh, a magistrate is required to appreciate the evidence. Now, let us say this case relates to, uh, let us say a quarrel. Let us say there is a fist fight. Let us say there is some allegation of use of or you know uh, threat with weapons. Now there is a intimidation by the accused with some weapons. Now this comes up before the magistrate court. The magistrate has to appreciate that the burden of proof is on the prosecution. Now we have to understand that whenever there is any prosecution under the IPC, the Indian Penal Court, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. The police, which does the investigation, should ensure that the charge sheet is filed. The charge is framed by the court. I, as I said, issues. You have charge being framed. Which is, charge is the equivalent of uh, the uh, criminal trial. So charges are framed. Charge sheet is different from a charge. Charge sheet is filed by the police after investigation, while a charge or charges are framed by the magistrate or the uh, sessions court. You know, you know, uh, deciding on what issues have to be decided, or what are the what are the allegations, or what the offences are, or we don't call it issues, we call it charges. Or even if you don't frame charges, you have the in certain cases you don't frame charges where the offences do not uh, fall under the category of framing of charges. You decide in a in a judgment you frame something called determination points for determination, and then the judge, the magistrate decides. It. So what happens is, judge when when let us say. Uh, there is a situation where I am a first class magistrate and also a civil judge. Now there are occasions where you have a judge who is also a civil judge and he also handles uh, matters in the criminal court as a magistrate. So he's a magistrate and he's also a judge. Now in such situations when he's dealing with, a, with an offense, criminal offense, you must remember the burden of proof is on the prosecution if it comes to offenses under the Indian Penal Court. Whereas, uh, now let us say there are some special offenses like Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substance, Substances Act, Negotiable Instruments Act, or you know, various other special uh, offenses or legislations. In such situations, the burden of proof is on the accused or the accused. There is a reverse, char, you know, reverse uh, uh, burden of proof to be uh, delivered by the accused. So accused has to prove himself innocent. So he is presumed to be guilty un until he is proved innocent in all other special legislations. But in the case of IPC, Indian Penal Court, an accused is deemed to be innocent till he is proved guilty. So we must keep in mind the uh, burden of proof. There is also something called the owners of proof. Burden of proof doesn't shift. Now let us say I frame issues or I frame charges. That is it. The burden of proof is on the plaintiff or the defendant or you know you decide who is to uh, prove. But there is something called owners of proof. Now let us say the plaintiff says that this is my uh, co-personary property. I'm one of the co-personers. He has discharged his burden of proof. Now it is for the defendant to, you know, you know, discharge his owners of proof further by telling that he was not given a share. He was his application or his suit for a share was rejected. He was not given this property. Something of that sort. So the owners of proof may probably shift, but the burden of proof, which is generally decided by the issues or the charges remain fixed. Now, generally, the general uh, you know, principle when it comes to criminal cases is beyond, you know, the, the prosecution is required to prove beyond all reasonable doubts for him to be convicted. A reasonable man, a prudent man should on the face of it say that this person 
is innocent or probably the prosecution has failed to prove the uh, the the crime to the hilt and it has failed to prove that this person has committed it so the uh, you know the, the prosecution is required to prove uh, to the hilt or beyond all uh, reasonable doubts whereas in the case of a civil trial or a civil case it's it depends on preponderance of probabilities now i go back to the criminal trial if let us say there is a doubt there is a gap there is you know an ambiguity somewhere in the trial that benefit of doubt goes to the accused in the case of uh, offenses under the indian penal code but you look at civil case a civil case you know generally it's a preponderance of all probabilities preponderance of probabilities now let us say you weigh the case of the plaintiff you weigh the case of the defendant look into the pleadings look into the evidence oral documentary look at everything and then you will have to decide on preponderance of probabilities which weighs more that person gets a relief so these are the basic differences in the jurisprudence of trial and decision making in the case of a criminal trial criminal case and a civil case so juris jurisprudence becomes important and uh, as i said art is something to be you know developed by appreciating by you know enjoying the way things are done now let us say you enjoy music so that is an art so similarly here you actually appreciate judgment when you read judgment you really appreciate the nuances and then you learn to develop on those lines and it is you know you read a couple of judgments read some judgments which make it really complicated read some judgments which make it really simple so that helps you understand how a judgment should actually be drafted um, and wherever possible it's better to avoid using you know foreign jargons unless these are settled principles of law and legal jargons are welcome but it should not be situation where it is too it's it shouldn't be obsolete so these are some of the things that we'll have to keep in mind and uh, i i see uh, and i thank you for your patient listening uh, if there are any questions we can take it sure sir uh, there are few questions from the participants uh, first one is can it be said that disputed facts and issues are same not necessarily this that's where i in fact it's a good question it's a, it's a very relevant question disputed questions of fact may not be drafted as issues now let us say there is a very important you know disputed question of fact now let us say uh, in the case that i gave you where i say that uh, the neighbor the defendant is encroached into my property and let us say a very important question that comes up is the defendant alleges that i have sold the property i am no more the owner of the property i have already sold the property and i am just in possession of the premises for some more time and as such i have i have no locus standi now this i deny as a plaintiff i deny this now this is a disputed question of fact but now this is not drafted by way of an issue so it's a disputed question of fact but it's not drafted by way of an issue but now what becomes an issue is only the relevant facts which turn around the case which are necessary for deciding the case now is this fact relevant for the purpose of deciding the case if it is relevant it is drafted as an issue if it is not relevant though it's a disputed question of fact it is not brought in by way of an issue now let us say the matter is posted for judgment at that point in time i see this that there is a dispute with regard to the ownership and i find it is relevant as a judge i find it relevant and i feel it should be brought in by way of an issue then i can recast the issue but the question is very relevant very important because every disputed question of fact need not become an issue so i think i've communicated and answered the question we may go to the next question few judgments are sometimes overruled by the courts so while reading a judgment how do you figure out that this particular judgment isn't overruled and it can be relied upon it can't be relied upon it can be relied upon it can be relied upon. so you will have to do some research it's a good question now when you actually look at some judgments they are overruled now if they are overruled that becomes precedent now let us say there's a decision of the high court that is overruled by the supreme court and the law is laid down there now do we how do we know whether certain decisions are overruled so that is something which we'll have to research on now probably today of course we have these uh, you know search uh, you know softwares 
like AAR or probably SEC or you know various other journals where you can actually make a search of uh, the decisions which have been overruled. Now, probably if you are relying on a decision, you can actually check whether this decision has been overruled. So that makes it easy for you to check out whether it is overruled or not. And um, now there are situations where there is a decision of the high court. This is, we, we come across this uh, in many uh, cases. There is a decision of the high court. It's taken up before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, it's a coordinate bench. In a sense, it's a two bench. It's a division bench. You have two judges. Two judges look into the case and then decide it in a manner that is, uh, or probably let us say it, uh, you know, reverses the judgment of the high court. But later on, it comes to the notice of the advocates or judges that there is another case law which has been decided by two judges in a contradictory manner. They have laid down a law which is contradictory. So in such situations, ideally, the coordinate bench, coordinate bench or are benches with equal number or strength, they have to refer it to a larger bench. So if, you know, ideally you cannot have a coordinate bench overruling addition of another coordinate bench. And overruling is done by a larger bench. And uh, basically coming back to the question, we'll have to look at the various uh, case laws to know if it has been overruled or not. So a little bit of research is required for that. Participants, you may unmute yourself or you may write your uh, question at the chat box. Uh, in fact, I must uh, you know, say that I did not deal with a lot of issues because it becomes too complicated. But if there are any issues which you feel require deliberation, please bring it up. And probably if you feel that any of the aspects that I dealt with was something that was not comprehensible, also please bring that up. I again request the participants, if they have any queries or questions, they may ask from sir. I think I'm holding them back from lunch. No, no, not at all. <laughs> you cannot teach anything in an empty stomach. No. Fine. Your uh, participants really liked your session, sir. They are saying the session was really insightful and thank you, all thank that outscored really clearly. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> So there is a question from Divya Jain. She's asking, ideally, how long should a judgment be? Uh, you cannot actually, it's a, it's, a good, it's a very good, interesting question. Actually, we cannot lay down a limit for the uh, length of a judgment. You cannot lay down the numbers in terms of pages. You cannot say this is what is brevity, this is not, this is what is brief and this is not brief. It depends on the facts of each case. Now, in the case, uh, now, let us say you have the Supreme Court judgment, you have this uh, Ram Janam movie judgment which came out, it runs to around 1,000 pages, 880 pages or so. Now, you have a decision that is rendered by five judges and of course, judgment that is written. Now, let us say you look at, you know, just, you know, just, you know look at Keshwan and Bharti case. You had uh, 13 judges, you had five judges who gave a uh, dissenting uh, view, six judges, the majority judges who gave the you know, who gave the uh, decision. So the point is, you know, each one would write a judgment or two or three judges would come together to write a judgment. Now, you cannot lay down here what should be the ideal number of pages because it would all depend on the facts of the case, the, uh, the, the law that becomes applicable, the, the controversy involved in the law, the, uh, the nuances in the law, the uh, uh, general principles probably that are applied by different other you know, foreign courts. So these are all looked at for the purpose of coming to a conclusion. And uh, generally what happens is when you have uh, the judgment running to many pages, many thousands of pages or thousand pages, you generally have an upshot of the judgment. A brief summary is given of the judgment for the convenience of the readers to understand what the judgment is all about. 
but uh, so we cannot strictly you know link the brevity of a judgment to the number of pages so it all depends again on the facts and the legal proposition that is being laid down this is another question from sajil khere he is asking is using legal maxims necessary in a judgment if you can it's very good uh, because what happens is you actually communicate because we know for a fact that the legal maxims have been settled they have been accepted now let us understand that uh, there is a position of law which says ubi just be remedial now uh, wherever there is an injury there is a remedy wherever there is a right there is a remedy now this is a settled position of law so i don't have to elaborate that principle in great detail if i can lay down a if i can use a particular legal jargon which is settled and which can be used now you know you have a way, you have a very big principle in fact i must say if you look at some of the old judgments in fact uh, brevity can actually be seen where uh, some of the judgments have been covered in two three pages four pages you know entire judgment is covered they briefly tell what the case of the plaintiff is defendant is they lay down the law the dispute that is to be considered and then they give the judgment they are you are the reasoning and the judgment is given so the point is you know uh, it's amazing to see such judgments and uh, it is wrong to think that only if i write at least a minimum of five pages or seven pages it's a good judgment not necessary you can be really brief and you can still can communicate everything that you wanted to communicate so that is something that we have to develop and uh, when it comes to legal jargon now for instance i will give you a small example is just pops up of my out of my mind now let us say there is a uh, contempt of court there's a contempt of court now the question is you know we you know a settled principle of law a legal proposition that no person can be a judge in his own cause no person can be a judge in his own cause now i pass an order the party breaches it can i sit as a judge to decide whether there is a contempt there is answer, the answer is no because i get biased there is a bias now this principle is also brought into the contempt of court side now but this principle is so in fact you know i must say this came much you know much later but this legal jargon or the legal principle is so succinctly laid down in this uh, legal jargon or probably the uh, usage legal usage so something of that sort so you know if you can use legal jargons and that helps you reduce a detailed explanation it can be used and sir next question is from harshwardhan first of all he is thanking you for the detailed and lucid session thank you thank you and uh, coming up to his doubt he is asking when the contention of the defendant in his written statement is proved to be false by evidence laid by the plaintiff can the defendant be held liable for perjury can the defendant be held liable for perjury in case it is found that the statements made by him are false correct right? absolutely now if the position is if the court gives a clear finding that the statement given by the defendant is false it's uh, you know on the face of it evident from the records and also the uh, uh, the uh, the commissioner report or whatever then what happens is you can take uh, the person for committing perjury but the practical problem is now let us say you look at perjury what happens what comes out of it is it perjury is a criminal offense perjury is also a civil wrong now probably you file a you know civil uh, case under torts for damages now you also file a just like defamation you also file a criminal uh, complaint now the question that crops up or the big challenge that you would be required to face is the burden of proof now the court the trial court may not have examined many aspects i would not have as an accused i would not have had the benefit of submitting all the documents there would have been some difficulty so you cannot come to a conclusion that there is a perjury it's a different matter if you say that i have lost the case it's a different matter if you say that i have not proved my case but that does not per se amount to a perjury so perjury we'll have to look at it very closely examine if it would pass the test of definition of perjury whether i will be in a position to stand the test and prove that he has actually committed a perjury and that you know he is liable to be punished for it or he is liable to pay compensation for that now it's not advisable to file a suit uh, you like it would not be advisable for you to initiate action for perjury because for the most part what happens is let us admit the fact that torts have not developed much in india in fact uh, though i must say india is one of the uh, finest countries which have come up with some of the best judgments uh, tort is a law which is yet to develop now probably 
uh, you have the Motor Vehicle Claims Act, which actually is a tort. Now, let us say there is an accident on the road. It's a tort. But this was developed into a separate legislation to ensure that that is taken care of. So this is a tort which is legislated. Now, but those legislations, those tortious acts which have not been supported by legislations, we really find it difficult to take it through and prove our case. But nevertheless, we can file a case if you are confident that he's complete perjury. All right, sir. Participants, if you have any queries or questions, you may ask those. Either you can write your question in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. And if I may add here, of course, I gave a practical example of how a case is dealt, plain pleadings, written statement issues, <coughs> portal and documentary evidence, and then the judgment. I gave you a practical view of things because probably in your judgment writing competition, you may not be given all these, or probably you may be given some of these aspects. Now, how do you examine it? Now, or probably just in a moot court competition, you may not know how actually things go in a court, but an understanding of that would actually help you submit, you know, uh, properly. Uh, you, you can make effective submissions if you actually know the practical reality. And uh, today, if you actually write a judgment, and if you are given the facts, it would not be far fetched or probably it wouldn't be uh, very distant uh, from the reality. So I think an understanding and a grasp of the uh, aspects that I brought out becomes essential. So I have a question if you may. Please, please. Yeah, like uh, they said, ki, uh, there are two different judgment uh, format for the civil judgment and the criminal judgment. So if you could give some little insight on that, like how you have to, you can make that attractive. Absolutely. It's uh, actually, it's an important point. Of course, I do not want to cover that because of uh, the time constraint. I was told one hour, I very clearly stuck to it. Let's understand in a civil case, you have a plaintiff who enters into the witness box. He leads evidence. He produces documents to support his case, to prove his case. And in the, uh, and the defendant, and the defendant leads his evidence, he produces documents, he gets into the witness box, gives oral evidence. Of course, oral evidence, we mean uh, both filing of an affidavit and cross-examination. Now, what happens is, uh, as I said, it's preponderance of probabilities in a civil case. And now, let us look at a criminal trial. Let us say there is a situation where it relates to uh, uh, Indian Penal Court. The prosecution leads the evidence of course, what happens is a charge sheet is filed. Once the charge sheet is filed, you know the uh, uh, the prosecution witnesses are brought in to the uh, court. More mostly, it is oral evidence. Oral evidence is led. The accused has the opportunity to lead cross examination. He can cross examine the witnesses to disprove all that he is required to do. What is? Let us understand the difference. What is it that an accused advocate is required to do? He is only required to disprove the statements of the plaint of the prosecution. He doesn't have to prove his case. He only has to prove that he only has to disprove the case of the prosecution. Now, in many cases, you have witnesses turning hostile. Probably in situations where the accused, uh, so in, in situations where the witnesses are asked to be pancha witnesses or mahajar witnesses, what happens is, or let us say there is an incident that has happened, there is an offense that has happened in a particular place. Some witnesses are taken to the place, some independent witnesses are generally taken to the place and a sketch is drawn of the place. Now, if the witnesses say that this sketch was drawn in the police station, the entire case fails. So it's a situation where the police have fabricated. Now, so all that I'm required to do as an accused in a criminal complaint is to show, to disprove the case of the prosecution. If I say that this sketch was created in the police station, you do not go to the place for the purpose of drawing the sketch. The whole thing goes out, it fizzles out. And uh, it is not necessary for the accused to get into the witness box. This is most important. In fact, if you probably remember uh, reading the constitution or probably if you, some of the uh, first year or second year students have not read the constitution, there is a basic principle that you cannot have self-incrimination as against the accused. So an accused need not or he cannot be compelled to enter the witness box. He may prefer not to get into the witness box. 
He may prefer to disprove the case of the prosecution and still be happy. He may say, I have disproved the case of the prosecution. I will not enter the witness box. From the evidence, oral or documentary of the prosecution, I will disprove their case and I will get acquitted. So it is absolutely possible. Neither the prosecution nor the magistrate nor the session judge can compel the accused to get into the witness box. So this is the basic fundamental difference between a criminal trial and a, uh, a civil trial. And uh, probably when you're writing a judgment in a, in a criminal case, you are required to examine the uh, examine closely the statements of the prosecution witnesses, whether they have you know uh, given any statement of admission which goes in favor of the accused. If it goes, you know the accused has made out his case and is entitled for an acquittal. And if there is some ambiguity, the benefit of doubt goes in favor of the accused. So this is the gist of the whole thing. Thank you. There's a question, sir. Uh, how to write a judgment without getting biased? Huh. So what happens is, you know, this is very common. That's why I said a fair trial results in a fair judgment. If there is no fair trial, there cannot be a fair judgment. So uh, that's where what happens is uh, at times we do see situations where the uh, judge gets biased. It is not that you blame the judge. It is human psychology. Now, probably even if you were judges, you would have got biased. Now, that is where you are required to appreciate the case of the accused as you know he says it. You appreciate the case as he says it. You know, probably you uh, have to uh, appreciate the case in an unbiased manner, and then examine the uh, the evidences. Now. What happens is, you know, uh, let me give you a small example. You are all aware of you are all aware of uh, negotiable instruments and check bounce complaints. Mm -hmm. What happens in a check bounce complaint is now the burden of proof is on the accused to show that he is not liable. There are three things that are required to be proved in a negotiable instruments uh, act. In the, in the case of a check bounce, one thirty eight section one thirty one, he has not signed. You know, th these are the points which are required to be proved by the complainant. The accused has signed the check that he is, you know, he is liable to pay the money. And the check was presented, it bounced, and then a notice was issued in accordance with Section 138. These are the three requirements to be proved by the complainant. And these are the same three requirements which are required to be disproved by the accused. If the accused disproves any one of them, he has he is entitled for an acquittal. Now, if you see a situation where the accused says, I am not liable to pay the money, I have signed it, yes. I've given it to you, yes. You issued the notice, yes. But I'm not liable to pay the money. Why? Because I paid an amount equivalent to the check amount to your brother, who you, you know, and you were the one who called upon me to pay him. There is no, so what happens is when I pay your brother, I have discharged the liability. I'm not liable to pay the money. So this is a defense which an accused takes. Now, what happens is generally, you look at the situation for the most part in check bonds company. Checks are issued, they are bounced, and accused take some defense, knowing fully well that they get convicted. Because you know, some defense has to be taken. So what happens is judges generally, magistrates generally get prejudiced. Whenever there's a one that get complaint, they think, no, accused is liable to pay the money. So this is where the prejudice crops in. Now, you have to, if you were to sit as a magistrate, you would also get into that situation. So that is where, at times, when there is a valid, valid defense, the magistrate is required to appreciate the defense. In spite of the prejudices, the judge is required to appreciate the facts of the case and see if the facts are probable. If there is a probability that this could have happened. So, so that's why it is absolutely possible that there could be prejudice. And uh, you know, it is the duty of the judges to overcome that. Uh, and so the next question is, do we have to write about both of the views of plaintiff and defendant? In the judgment. Yes, it is very much, uh, it's a very good question. What happens is we uh, see some of the judgments where the judge writes only the views of the winning party. Now, let us say the suit is decreed in favor of the plaintiff. He only says what the plaintiff says, what is his evidence, how the evidence has been corroborated, all these things he brings out. He doesn't give much focus on the defense taken. Now, what happens is there is a very clear statement. You know, justice should not only be done, it should also seem to be done. Now, there is every possibility that the defendant may think the judge was biased. The judge, you know, was, you know, having uh, probably, uh, there was any, any other reason for coming to this conclusion. 
there could be you know imaginations running wild in the mind of the magistrate in the mind of the defendant to avoid all these it is better the judge brings out in brief the statement of the plaintiff the, the defense of the uh, uh, defendant the issues involved the documents produced the oral evidence and then it is for him to reason out based on the issues as to why he considers this particular reasoning more probable and then he passes a judgment so this makes it more appealable in the sense it's, it's more convincing even a person who loses it is satisfied that this is the reason why he is gone against me and probably you know it is you know at times if the you know there are occasions where the judgments are so very well delivered the party who's lost it may decide not to go on appeal and even if, even if he goes on appeal he may not make out a case so the judgment should actually be written in that manner where it becomes clear that is not not got a case but this may not be possible in all the cases where the there is a there is a very thin line of dispute that is to be decided so you have to mention the case of both the plaintiff and the defendant and that is fair that is being fair and impartial okay so we don't have any more questions now so, so I, i thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing Thanks. and i wish all of you all the best thank you uh, all your future endeavors thank you thank you sir this workshop was for the compilation of national judgment writing competition and all the details of the competition are available on our website interested ones visit our website or you may uh, directly contact us via mail or through our contact details thank you so much sir for this enriching session thank you thank you very much it was really nice uh, addressing the uh, students and i appreciate your effort and i wish that your efforts are uh, uh, you know uh, you know probably taken advantage of by the students let them take full advantage of all, all that you come up with so it actually brings out uh, good advocates into the bar and good judges into the bench thank you yes. thank you sir bye so by concluding uh, on behalf of law internships i would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to mr s vivekanand sir for taking out time from his busy schedule and interacting with the young minds it was truly an enriching session sir thank you again